Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Butterfield Alpacas and Fiber Arts Podcast. This is episode 12. I am Tasha Butterfield, your host, owner of Butterfield Alpaca Ranch in Nebraska, and a fiber arts enthusiast. I knit, crochet, and spin, and I talk about all these things here in this podcast. This podcast I do once a month, and other times of the month, at least three times, depending on how long the month is, um, I do other videos called Alpaca Life, where I talk about things related to raising alpacas and what to do with alpaca fiber. So last month we talked about things like the importance of sorting your fiber, um, what options you have for processing your fiber, and the berserk male syndrome, which I think was my favorite of all three because it's a really important topic in the alpaca community. And I did not find anyone talking about it on YouTube. So there you go. It's about 30 minutes and I cover a lot of topics. So if you are raising alpacas or consider considering raising them, you definitely want to go check that video out. Uh, videos coming up in Alpaca Life series, again, have to do with yarn because we're going to look at products that you can uh, create at all micron levels. Um, what your options are at the mill, and then understanding yarn plies and weights, which if you're sending your fiber to a mill, of course you need to know things like that, because plies and weights are pretty important for deciding what kind of yarn you want back. And for most of my viewers of the podcast, you understand that stuff because you use yarn. <laughs> but uh, that video is geared towards people who are making yarn for us from alpacas or alpaca fiber. Yeah, that's better. All right, so um, I will have a link to those videos down in the description box, but you can also go to the homepage of my channel and there's a playlist of all the Alpaca Life videos. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you like all these topics and hit that notification bell. That way YouTube will notify you when a new video comes out. As always for my videos, I include timestamps down the description box so you can skip around to different topics that I cover because I know my episodes are pretty long. <laughs> As for the ranch update, I was concerned I was only going to have some sad news for you, um, mostly because, I mean, December, winter came early. I will say that. We got a couple snowstorms. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons that this podcast is put up late because we had a blizzard last week, which I think was the second, maybe the third of the month. Um, but I also had issues with my furnace at home, which has to be replaced. And the furnace at the store was not working. So every time I went to film this episode, something got in my way. But here we are. You know what? I forgot to say, Happy New Year to everyone. This episode was originally supposed to be put out on January 1st of 2019 and uh, totally missed that goal, but uh, I still am going to say Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, this uh, episode will go up just, you know, a few days after the new year, but still I hope 2019 is a great year for all of you. And um, if you're like me, you have already set some goals. I don't call them resolutions because resolutions you tend to not keep. But goals, goals I can accomplish. So I hope all of you have set some goals and that you will succeed in accomplishing them as well. Okay, so back to the ranch stuff. Um, let me start off with the sad news. Let's just get that out of the way. I did lose two girls since the last episode, and this would be Sonata and Sunday. Both girls were older and had declining health. Um, I do not get rid of animals when they are of no use um, because I think all the animals have use. I have found a purpose for all the fiber, no matter what micron level or what condition the fiber is in. Most of the time, unless it's crazy felted, but even then, there's there's uses for all the fiber. So I do not call or get rid of any animals that are no longer seem like worthy because I can um, get them to pay for themselves no matter what, and I prefer them just to live out their days. Um, and that was the case for these two girls. Their health was declining, like showing age. 
Um, for those of you who don't know, alpacas live an average of 20 years, and both of these girls were approaching that number. So it was not a surprise um, that they went. Uh, it's, it's sad to lose an alpaca for any kind of reason, uh, but knowing that these girls had a long, good life uh, makes it easier to say goodbye. And I made sure before they went that I, you know, each, I, sh I should say this for all of my older animals, I make sure to talk to them and appreciate them and like say goodbye because some of them you never know when it's the last time you never know um, and so it's nice to kind of recognize and appreciate them before they go and like I said in this case it was not a surprise that they went and um, I feel like it's, it's a blessing when they go at the beginning of winter and they don't have to kind of suffer through another cold season and December being as cold and as snowy as it was, which is quite unusual. Um, um, I'm glad that they did it now rather than like March, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, Sunday was one, she was wear coats all winter long cause she had a, um, she was very easy. One that was easily, easy to shiver. I don't know how to say this. Like she would get cold easily and shiver. And so she would wear a coat a lot. Um, another one of my girls toy dancers, she does that as well. So like, it's not going to be a surprise uh, when she goes, but she's another older one. I think she was even older than Sunday because I just lived with these girls and I know they're older and I have to like look at their certificate to see how old they actually are because I forget, but I know that they're of age and it's acceptable <laughs> that they are gone. And okay, I've talked about this for too long. There you go. Um, I'm down two girls and I was talking about goals earlier. One of my goals is to invest in younger females. My boys, they're all um, moderate, like younger to middle aged alpacas. I have a wide range of genetics and colors to work with over there. Um, but my girls, a lot of them are older. And uh, so something in terms of the quality of my herd, um, goals for 2019 is to invest in some young, um, high quality fiber females that are good for the fiber arts products. Um, so just put that out there. That's one of my goals um, because now this year I've lost what three, th three girls. I mean Bridget was the other one. I'm kind of thinking I'm forgetting somebody, but that might be it. Um, so yeah, my female numbers are starting to decrease. Like last year, um, late fall, I had lost Sophie. So it's. I'm watching my numbers decline for the females, and yes, I want to replace them. Okay, so as I was saying before, I was concerned that that was all I was going to be able to tell you about the ranch, other than saying, hey, it snowed out there, we had some crazy weather. Yeah, that's not really exciting. Um, but Thor has given us something to watch. Starting yesterday, Thor has been a bad boy. And it's because he's getting out of his pasture and going where he's not supposed to go. So got a call yesterday. Thor was out. Um, what it is is that my property is right on the highway that a lot of people drive on. And most people in the area know that there's alpacas here. And uh, they've been here long enough to where they know if they are where they're not supposed to go. And so someone had called the sheriff's office, which is what you do when you see an animal out. Uh, the sheriff's office knows who all the property belongs to, and they have ways to identify an animal and who it belongs to, and then they call the owner. So that's what happened. Um, sheriff's office got a call that there was an alpaca out walking towards the highway. And it was Thor. Somehow he had gotten out, and he was walking in the hay field and walking along the fence that separates his pasture from the hay field, but he was walking up towards the road rather than back towards his barn. Um, but got him back in really easily. And then today I got another call 
sorry, that was a text. Today I got another call that there was an alpaca out, but I was at a friend's house an hour away. So I called my friend who does chores for me. Uh, she lives literally six minutes away. So I called to see if she was home and able to come over. And she was. But she had a hard time getting Thor back in his pasture or in his barn. Yesterday was easier. Today, not, <laughs> not so much. So what ended up happening was... Um, he ended up all the way over at the girl's barn, still like not in an enclosed area. He still had access to the road, just the road on the other side, actually the road you can see behind me. And, um, she got him into the girl's barn, but not in the part of the barn where the girls are. So that's where he has been. And that is why I'm here. I'm here earlier than I wanted to be. Um, but I'm going to go inside. I'm going to feed Oliver and... Halter Thor to walk him back where he needs to be. And then I need to do a thorough search of how he has gotten out. Because my experience here, once an alpaca finds a way out, they will do it repeatedly until I find that spot. And once I fix it, then that's it. But each time they do it, they get a little more brave and wander a little further away from where they're supposed to be. And I keep getting calls from the sheriff that there's an animal out. Um, yeah, this has happened quite a few times over the last three years of being at this property. And so I've come to understand how this kind of thing works. So that is on the agenda today. Why, there he is. Mr. Thor, what are you doing? Do you know how you got here? Maybe the girls are off grazing and he's in here by himself. Oh, yeah, he's knocked stuff down right there. Yeah, he's trying to get out. All right, I'll feed Oliver and we'll get him back over to his barn. Let's see where he's at. I see Gus. Oliver! Oh, here he is. Oh, sorry, I didn't get that. Me and Thor. Oop. There we go. I think he knows where we're going. <laughs> the key is to not let him drag me. Nope, Thor, we gotta go over this way. Come on, this way. Okay, really hard to film this and move him at the same time. the lighting is so bad. Overcast winter day. There's thunder. Am I getting him for you? All right. So we have to walk past a small group of geldings to get to Thor's pasture. I can't even tell if I'm getting him. Okay, there we go. He knows where we're going. Thing is, he knew he was where he was not supposed to be. He probably didn't know how to get back. <laughs> I 
can see his uh, footprints here in the mud. All right, Thor is back home and he's going to relieve himself. Who knows the last time he got to do that. Here Roman is coming to see what's going on. There were some others who saw us approaching and were humming, which is usually Shaman because he has to know all business at all times. Nope, he's way down there. So now he's eating a bit too. And there's water over there for him when he's ready. So he knows he's home. Now let's go check the fence. Okay, this part here is a, actually a gate, a wire gate. It is not the best, but I've not had an issue before. The only thing here that I saw is this post here. I have it rigged up where there's two of them that weigh it down. And this one here was not in place. It was actually over on the side, totally not attached. And without that, this could easily be lifted up. And that is a technique that Thor knows. So maybe this is it. Otherwise, I suppose I need to walk on the inside. Let's walk on the inside. Because that's where the stables are. Okay, so on this fence, it is all attached on the inside of the pasture. So what I'm looking for now is anywhere where these staples, I think they're also called brads, are loose and falling off and the wire is just limp and can easily be moved. If you watched my video on alpaca fencing, you know this part right here. Not recommended. But this was part of the original fencing with the property. It isn't the plans to replace it, but that is very costly, so it is still on the list. Not done. Um, but I have not had an issue with injury or such things. Checking all this kind of stuff that I didn't get. Well, It didn't take Thor long to get down with his friends and start grazing. It's probably hard to see because of the... It's so cloudy today. He's one of those dark dots out there. Look who I found today. Over here by the girls' barn. Mm-hmm. And guess who's on the other side of that little fence? So the door is closed here to the girls and I'm just going to put him in that stall over there. He can't get over and he'll have a little buddy with store next to him. Oh yeah, see they see open gates and they're so curious. He's looking for those girls though. Come on bud, go over in that stall. He has a sticker in it. Where is that? You got to take care of that. There you are. Sorry, I don't know if I got that on film or not. It's watching him, not the camera. Okay. He's in prison for now. <laughs> got to do some more research on the fence. So we have Thor in his prison stall here. He's got hay and water and bedding. And he really wants to meet these friends here, but he can't get through. Nope, you can't get through, bud. And here's Gus with the tail and the ears back. And this is Gus. Uh, 
protecting, defending the girls. He seems to see Thor as some kind of a threat. He's making sure, Gus is making sure he's between him and, between Thor and the girls. I don't have time to stay and watch this play out. <laughs> I have a place to be. Um, but here is Oliver with milk on his face because he was in a hard time nursing today. Oh, let's try it. Nope. Keeps spitting the nipple out. I don't know. Does it taste funny? Look at that milk on his face. Yeah. Sorry, the lighting here is so bad. You want to try again? No. Okay, I'm going to have to go. Here's some of the girls. They'll sniff across the fence and... I mean, they're keeping their distance back because Gus is there. It's very interesting. And then Oliver, in the midst of it, he knows something's different, something's going on. Here we are, day three. And Thor is still in his stall because this is just before Christmas and... I have extended hours at the store. I don't have time to play his games. So he's staying in the stall for a few days until I am able to figure out how the heck he's getting out of his pasture. And of course he's complaining. And since I walked in, he's really complaining because he knows I can do something about it. And sorry, that was Oliver tugging on me. He's tugging down today. We got it worked out. Don't know what that deal was yesterday. Um, but we got Oliver here. Still, he's, he's clucking away. It's interesting. At least that's what I call this sound that llamas make. It sounds like clucking. <laughs> but, you know, it's in response to Thor. And Thor's complaining, but, you know... He'll get over it. He has to. And I do not know if he's making a connection between getting out and being stuck in that stall now. But I feel bad he's in this little 10 by 10 space, but uh, it's his own fault. You hear him? I feel bad, but hey, I can't have them out. Ooh, are you done? I just dropped it. There's a little bit left. A little bit left. I forgot to film what we did today. I meant to. Totally forgot to get the camera out when we did it. My great uncle is here today helping me. Because we put this welded wire across the fence. This... A wire fence that I had up, which was so poorly put up. Um, so now it's a much better boundary. And I'm thinking this is the most likely place that Thor was getting out. So what he did, we brought him back. Uh, we walked him over. And after he kind of got settled in here, then he was starting to mun and um, or hum and moan and uh, you know you could tell he wanted to go back to where the girls were so he came up to this fence and he was testing it seeing where he could get through well, realized he couldn't get through so he started making his way down the fence and testing it and there was one place that he tried and there's his fiber he tried couldn't get through He's made his way all the way up the fence. Let's see if I can zoom in. You can see him there. He's testing the fence all the way up, trying to find a place to get out. So we'll just stay and see if he finds a weak spot. We can zoom in even more. Nope, I'm zoomed in the most, the most I can. There you have
have it, the big adventure over the last couple of weeks of dealing with Thor. <laughs> he is such a character, such a character. Anyway, thanks to him, I got to reevaluate the whole fence line and do some things that needed to have been done. Um, and I expect that he's the only one who would have found any place to get out because he's so small. And he knows how to go underneath wire fences if they're if there's any kind of give to them. He knows how to go underneath of them. And now he knows where the girls are and how to get there, which is not really a good thing. But as long as I can keep him in his pasture and where he's supposed to be, that's not gonna be a problem. I had this issue before with uh, Oliver's dad, Vinny. Um, last year after I would used him for breeding, he learned where the girls were and uh, he found some weaknesses in the fence as well. And now he's a llama, so of course he's bigger. He, he's the opposite of Thor when it comes to my older boy group. Thor is the smallest, but Vinny would be the biggest. And so I had to replace fencing in uh, certain areas because he was able to actually jump over it. <clears throat> but once that fence was in place and he realized that he couldn't cross it anymore in time, I mean, like a week or two, uh, he was, you know, complaining and wanting to go over there, but eventually he realized he couldn't and he just kind of accepted it. And that is what I need Thor to do. <laughs> he needs to accept <laughs> that he can't get over there because I don't want him over there. I do not need winter babies. So as for the store, the biggest thing to tell you is that my Chicago location has closed. Um, closed that at the end of 2018 after the holiday season. November, December in Chicago, of course, is the biggest month. I mean, massive sales. But the rest of the year, they kind of trickle in. And the Chicago location was more of an experiment. In 2017, um, or Christmas of 2017, my mom did a pop-up shop and it did very well. So we thought, well, let's try having a permanent location in this place down the street, which uh, it's called the Andersonville Galleria. And it's kind of like a micro mall, but vendors and artisans can have a little space that they rent, but you have to maintain it in terms of like the inventory and making it, keeping it looking nice and that kind of thing. Um, but what the Galleria does is they have cashiers there that help the customers. Um, so you don't have to be there in person to be selling your stuff. You just need to maintain your space. And that's what my mom did. So like I said, it was more of an experiment. Okay, for um, 2018, let's just kind of see how it goes. And like I said, we discovered, again, November, December, great months for sales. The rest of the year, not so much. So decided to close the permanent location and go back to doing pop-up shops um, or consignment or something like that. I still want to have a Chicago presence because there are products I create um, that do very well in that market, but not in my Nebraska market. So I like having that outlet. And since my parents live there, it works out quite well that they're able to do that for me. The other factor in closing the store was my parents are moving here this spring. <laughs> so my mom was not going to be there to maintain the space. And that's where we're going to do the pop-ups, the shops, um, more so during the holidays. So again, November, December, I'll be looking for a space to use during that time period. Um, and so for those of you in Chicago who have enjoyed that location, so sorry. For the time being, all this stuff will be available online. But um, make sure you are on my mailing list and following me on Facebook to uh, be updated on when a pop-up shop will be opening up in Chicago somewhere um, and when and for how long and all that kind of stuff. And uh, for the rest of you, you will see more of the products that were in Chicago online and here in my Alma store. So this Alma store, of course, is like kind of like the flagship store because this is where I am and this is where I'm creating product. And so it's kind of like the home base um, and anything that you order online 
uh, comes out of the Nebraska store. So um, I will put a link to the store down in the description box and here across the screen for you to go if you want to go check that out um, after you watch this video. <laughs> All right, so on to the goodies of fiber arts. One of my big accomplishments that I did towards the end of last year is I updated my Ravelry. And I've been on Ravelry for years, as many of you probably are as well, a lot of my viewers. And for those of you who don't know, Ravelry.com, it's a website. It's like, it's like Facebook for yarn people is how I describe it, where you have a free profile and it has in a massive pattern database, including a ton of stuff that is free. Um, but there's a lot of tools in there that help keep you organized with your stash of stuff and your projects you got going on and the tools that you have in terms of um, crochet hooks and knitting needles and all that kind of stuff. Like you can be super, super organized if you want. And I've known how to use Ravelry for a really long time, but I've not been so good at maintaining it. And a lot of times I forget to even go on there. But one of my goals, another goal for 2019 is to use Ravelry more to help me be productive and to keep track of stuff. And especially when I was thinking about this podcast and trying to keep track of all the projects over a month's time, I was like, I need to do it on Ravelry so I can remember that project I finished three weeks ago. I need to tell you about it. So um, you can find me on Ravelry. The, the link for that is also down in the description box. Um, friend me there. You can see my projects, what I'm working on, things that I talk about here on the podcast. Um, I do my best to keep it updated on there and give you as much information as possible. Um, so, yes. I, I accomplished that before the end of the year. I put all my projects on there, including my spinning projects. I don't know how many of you are aware, especially if you're a spinner. You can keep track of your fiber stash and your spinning projects. And then when you've completed a skein of something, you've spun up something, that goes into your yarn stash, which then you can use for a knitting or crochet project. So I have all that updated in there, which was super exciting. And like I said, I'm going to do my best to kind of maintain it. Um, I also organize my queue. I've had stuff in my queue for a long, long time. And as most of you could probably relate, over time, your preferences change and the projects that you want to do change. Um, you know, things stay in your favorites because they're always your favorites or maybe not, but the stuff that was in my queue that I no longer was interested in doing, at least in the near future, um, I took out, of course it was still my favorite so I can find it later, but um, totally redid my queue to be truly what I want to accomplish next and truly reflect my interests right now. And so, I don't know how many I had in my queue, maybe 20 something, um, and I have it down to, I don't know, six, seven now, something a little more realistic, um, and found some really amazing patterns. Anyway, if you're on Ravelry, Ravelry, feel free to go check out my profile and see what I've done there. Maybe um, inspire you to do a project, and maybe we can do something together, a uh, cow, whether it's knitting or crocheting. Speaking of a cow, I did join one. Are we talking about? I'm going to talk about that later um, during knitting, because it's a a knitting cow. Because first, I wanted to talk about spinning. And I was so excited about this because my fractal spin project. So this is what I have done. I started with this braid. And now for those of you who don't know what fractal spinning is, let me put up that diagram to show you. You take um, fiber, uh, in my case it was comb top, and something that is in three colors. You take that braid, or whatever form it's in, split it into threes. The first third you spin as one ply. From you know the first color, second color, third color, all as one ply. 
All right, so your second third, you take that and you split that into thirds. So uh, in th this would be your second ply. That second ply is going to repeat first, second, third color, first, second, third, first, second, third. Then, as you can imagine, the last third is the third ply. Well, you take that and you break it down into nine. So you have nine little strips in which your colors repeat one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, you know, all the way through nine times. That is your third ply. And then you spin them all together, those three plies together. So this is the braid that I started off with, the green, purple, and white. I love purple and green, and I love white. This was like the perfect choice for me. Um, this braid is actually from Spindle, Shuttle, and Needle. I will put a link to it down in the description box um, if you're interested in this as well. This was a Colombian Rambouillet uh, blend, wool blend. And so here you can see me splitting up the fibers. With my wheel, I only have three bobbins, and because this is a three ply and I needed a bobbin to ply onto, what I did is I took each of those plies and put them into a cake, and then set those cakes to the side on the side of me and did a three ply from there onto one bobbin. Now, this was a good thing for me to experiment with. Um, have an experience doing because I know how to improve it for next time but if you are able to keep your three plies on bobbins I would recommend that because towards the end of the cakes it kind of got messy <laughs> so I would recommend if you have enough bobbins to leave it on there but if you don't like me this was a perfectly acceptable way to do it just know that as those cakes get smaller it might be more of a challenge to keep them separate. So if you come up with a way to do that, all more power to you. Um, but I love the way that this turned out in the end. Here is the final, final skein. Look at that. It was fun spinning this up because there was times when I could see all three colors applied together. I could see all three plies being the same color at times. It was fun watching the change of the colors because it was always different. I just love it. I have no idea what I'm going to make this into yet. Um, it's going to be in my stash for a while until I figure out what I really want to do. My current project on the wheel is 
some merino roving that I got from my fiber share partner. I about forgot what it was called. Um, fiber share happens twice a year, I think, at least twice. But it's, uh, I'll put the link down in the description box, but basically it's a fiber swap. You're, you are assigned to two partners. One of them sends you stuff and the other one you send stuff to. So you fill out the survey so that uh, your partner knows your likes and just you like your preferences and all that stuff. And um, then they come up with like a package for you. There is a minimum. I think it's like four ounces, but a lot of people kind of go more than that. Uh, some people really go overboard. Um, but my fiber share partner was Lori of Ocean Wind Knits. And so what I'm spinning up now is merino roving that she hand dyed just for me. I've never had something so special when it comes to fiber. <laughs> but I want to give you, this is the, oh, yep, yeah, the tag on it. The sunshine is really making a, an issue here, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so there she, she's actually out of Canada, Ontario, Canada. Um, I'll put this link down in the description box if it would be easier to just click on that for you. But go check her out. She has some beautiful products. Really wonderful. Um, she also sent me an, another type of roving. When I get to that, I'll show you that. Actually, if you're interested in it, um, go to my Ravelry profile and you'll see it listed there. Ocean Wind Knits is her name. OceanWindKnits.ca if you wanted to go to her website. Okay. Now on to knitting. Let me adjust my notes. They're so long. I have to <laughs> move my, my notes. I have a finished object in knitting. And that is what I'm calling the new knitter scarf. It's, it's not super special. This is just all garter. I wanted to do a project that I could show people who were interested in taking the beginning knitting class, something that they could make when they finished. So this, of course, the garter stitch being all knit stitch back and forth, really simple to do. And I chose a yarn that is variegated in such a way that it looks really striking in this garter stitch. And I really, really like it. I ended up using two um, skeins of yarn for this. This is the Brown Sheep Laniloft. It's a single ply worsted weight. I forget the name of the color. I want to say Rose Blush maybe. Of course I'll write it down here and link it down in the description box. Um, again, if you're on Ravelry, all that's there as well. If you're interested in this color, I do have it on my website. Um, I'll put that description box too if you're interested in it. Um, love, love, love this color. I love brown sheep line loft. I think it, it's great for a single ply yarn. It's one of my favorite things to work with. Um, so yeah, this, this is my finished object and it felt like it took forever. Uh, but it's done. One of the things that I chose to do with it, um, because it's, it was just stockinette, really simple, is I wanted to teach myself how to knit without looking. So that's what I do with this. You know, because of the pearl bumps, it was easy to uh, kind of pick that up. And so I would sit at home in front of the TV and, and knit without looking. And I did a pretty good job, I think. Um, I felt very proud of myself that I was able to do this. And um, I think it turned out great. All right, I had to go shift things a bit to get the sun off my head <laughs> just kind of I don't know the sunshine it's a it's a tricky thing here but I'm learning each video I make I'm learning on to works in progress last podcast I talked about some socks that I was working on um, but I didn't have them here with me to show you and this time I remembered this is my first attempt at two at a time toe up socks I was inspired to use the Turkish cast on by Allison of Lofty Loops Yarns. Um, she also has a podcast. I'll link that down below. And uh, she has a video on how she does her 
cast on for the toe-up socks. And she has a Turkish cast on. And I was interested in doing toe-up socks. I've done cuff down before, but I want to do toe-up socks um, to help oh, control the yarn, I guess, you know, to know how long you can make it before uh, finishing them and being able to use all of the yarn if you want. So that was something I wanted to experience, experience or experiment with. So I did try her Turkish cast on, but in this project, I also wanted to do two at a time because I'd never done that. Um, and I wanted to do two at a time for the benefits of, um, you know, the tension being the same. You uh, finish the two socks at the same time so you don't have the second sock syndrome. <laughs> and again, I'm still learning about sock knitting and uh, my gauge and like my needle size that I prefer and um, how many stitches to use and heels and stuff like that. So after watching Allison's video, she did one sock at a time. She prefers to do one sock at a time. And um, so went and looked up another video on Turkish cast on for two at a time. I'll link that down below as well if you are interested. Um, so that's where this began. And I started these early fall back before you actually wanted to wear socks when the weather was still pretty nice. And I wanted them done as my fall socks. As you can see, beautiful fall color. Um, and there's a cat hair right there. But you can also see I didn't finish them because a bunch of other projects got in the way. But um, I have been re-inspired to complete these socks because I'm wanting wool socks. Uh, there were a couple times this past week in which I would have wanted to wear wool socks and I didn't have any. And the one pair that I have made, I could only find one sock. I don't know what happened to the other sock. So I'm like, you know what? I really need to finish these. It does not matter if they're fall colors because they go in boots and no one sees them, but they keep my feet nice and warm. So yes, now I'm on a mission to continue these socks. But I wanted to share with you um, the yarn. It is Malabrigo sock in the Arbol colorway number 858. I bought this yarn a number of years ago, so I don't know if the colorway is still available or not. Um, here it is in the ball, which you can see I've undone a number of times. And let's see the other one. Which, of course, doesn't look really similar. There you go. <laughs> and I have more here as well. Got more, more yarn. So that is it for my toe up two at a time socks. And maybe I should set a goal of in the next podcast. I can't guarantee they'll be done, but I do want progress. You know, it reminds me, the heel I wanted to try with this was the fish lips kiss heel. I, I bought that pattern. Um, that was intended to try on these as well. So we'll see if that's what I do or if I decide to do that for different socks. But I have decided that I'm not too fond of doing two at a time because it feels like it takes so much longer to get them done. And I think next time I want to try doing one at a time. And in time, my tension is going to get better. See, when I made my first uh, pair of socks, that the tension on the two socks were quite different. But it might have been because they were my first pair. I'm you know, not quite used to it yet. But I figure the more socks I make, the more consistent I'm going to be in my tension for the socks. So that's going to be kind of like a not really a factor anymore. So I think next time um, I'll try just one at a time, but I do like the Turkish cast on and working toe up. So we'll see. we'll see how that goes. The next project I wanted to talk about was this scarf that I had made and I showed in the last episode of um, a two tonal scarf that I had done. And it was from Blue Sky Fibers American Scenic line, which is something I do carry in my store. It is American fibers, American made. Um, it is milled in Canada, um, designed by 
an American designer. So, you know, it's a very American product, which is why I wanted to carry it. Um, and I went to make a sample made of this yarn. I started off with using one of the patterns from Blue Sky that used all four colors that are part of this line and decided, nope, I'll watch the last episode for my reasoning about all that. So I ended up with this scarf that was pretty wide but ended up not being very long. Um, and I did one color, it wasn't very long, so I had another color just for some interest to show off a different color. Um, and in the end, the length was not very long, not a length of scarf that I would prefer. Um, but I put it on a mannequin, put up like it was here before, and it was fine, but it was nothing special. And the longer it was up there, the more I was like, you know, I'm just going to rip that out and make it into something else. So that's what I've done. And this is my current attempt at making something nice with it. So these were the two colors, um, River Rock and... Oh, I have a hard time remembering the names of these. Anyway, um, I'll put it down below. So this is my current experiment. I wanted, first of all, to make a longer scarf so it's not as wide as the other one. But I also wanted a way of really, like, in a different way, blending these two colors in a fun way. Um, and so I had in my mind a way of doing this cable in which the colors did this. So I experimented a little bit and figured it out, um, experimented with what to do along the sides and just uh, chose to do a seed stitch here. And it's working out quite well. I am writing the pattern for this and it will be available <laughs> when I'm done. I have some friends who are also gonna um, test the pattern for me. And so we'll just see, but yes, what do you think? I was so excited when I was making it going, it's doing what I wanted to do. Well, look at how tall it is. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how it goes. If it stays a scarf or if I do a cowl where I join it. Those are yet to be determined. Okay. Next is the cow. Okay, let's talk about the cow. I have never done a mystery cow before. But I hear people talking about it, like on other podcasts and in store, like other yarn stores doing mystery knit-alongs or crochet-alongs. But I've never participated in one, despite them sounding really fun and interesting. So towards the end of 2018, right around that time where I was doing my Ravelry updates and stuff, I was like, you know what? I want to do a mystery cow. Let's see if there's one out there. <laughs> of course, there's mystery cows, um, but I wasn't quite sure how to go about finding them. If you know of a way to do that, I don't know, is there um, a group on Ravelry or something where people can post their knit-alongs? I don't really know. How do you find out about knit-alongs or crochet-alongs? Like, is there a central place to find such information? I don't know. But what I did was a Google search. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just typed in mystery knit along. There were a few options that came up. I ended up going with the first one on the page. And that is the mystery knit along by the Rose City Yarn Crawl. There's, let's see. Oh, there we go. I don't want to give away too much mystery knit along Rose City yarn crawl which is um, Rose it's a in the area of Portland Oregon I believe if you're from that area correct me if I'm wrong but what this is a knit along leading up to the yarn crawl for this area so the their idea is you do this knit along and then you wear what you created at the yarn crawl which I think is pretty fun. Um, and I went with this one because I looked at what the designer had created in the past and I liked what she done, what she has made in the past. See, the question is, a mystery knit along, you don't know what it is. How do you know if you're gonna like it? Right? So um, I did look at past knit alongs, past designs of this designer, 
And I did really like what she has done before. So I thought, oh, pretty good way to go. Um, most likely I'll like this one too. So let me just go for it. Um, message from the designer. Let me tell you. The designer, first of all, is Rosemary Hill, also known as Romy. I think that's how it's said. Inspired by the great national parks and forests of the West, iconic knitwear designer Rosemary Hill, also known as Romy, brings us yet another spectacular mystery knit along. Just as we look forward to new growth as we work to preserve our great parks and forests, your beautiful semicircular shawl will blossom with each new clue. So I'm a, a nature person. I love nature, forests, parks. I mean, that's right up my alley. So I thought, this is a good fit for me. I'll give it a try. It didn't cost that much to join. Uh, I'll put a link to this, of course, down in the description box. You can go check it out. But this knit along does not start until January 21st. So if this sounds like something interesting to you, you have time. You have time. So the pattern is available now. You can go and purchase it. You can also join the Ravelry group, of course. Um, and then the first clue comes out on January 21st. And there's five clues all together. And their idea is that um, you have it done for their their Yarn Crawl, which is March 7th through 10th. If you're in that area, go check it out. Um, but this shawl is going to require two skeins of yarn. Um, there's a, a lighter solid color and a darker tonal variegated that is required. So, of course, I went through my store trying to find yarn for this knit along. I did find the one, the darker tonal variegated, which... I'm going to use this one. So um, it is very subtle in change of tone in the variegation, but there's um, one ply is all dark. It might be a dark charcoal gray, um, but then the other ply is the variegated part. So we got blue and purple, which in some areas is pink and that kind of thing. This is a two-ply fingering, 400 yards, 55% alpaca, 30% bamboo, 10% merino, and 5% icicle. This is by, you probably saw already, the Shepherd's Mill, which is one of the brands that I carry. This is their Frost Line and the Forest Berries Gradient, which is what this is. And I just loved it so much. But I have not found the lighter solid color that I want to go with it. I do have a couple more weeks to figure it out though. Yes. So yeah, kind of interesting. I have a yarn store, but I don't have the yarn I want. <laughs> but I'm going to visit a friend. I'm going to the Shepherd's Mill actually on Saturday. So I'm going to see if they have something that will go along with this. Um, they carry other brands besides their own. But they might have something of their own that will go really well with this. So in the next podcast, I will show you my progress because we will be a couple weeks into the, the cow by that time. Uh, so I'm excited. Okay, so that is knitting. What do we got next? Crochet. Got to move my notes again. Finish object. Isn't it exciting to say finish object? <laughs> So my finished object is the cloud burst shawl, which was my work, one of my works in progress in the last podcast. So this is a free pattern I found on Ravelry. I will put it down in the description box for you. I used brown sheep cotton fleece, which is 80% cotton, 20% wool. And I had been looking for something to make out of this cotton fleece yarn. Okay, I talked about this in the last podcast too. But I wanted something that wasn't just like washcloths and stuff. And I found this pattern, which was really beautiful. And uh, it uses two strands together. So, of course, it crochets up really quickly. And I was almost done with it in the last podcast. So you can see here, I have blocked it, and it's on a mannequin in the store, and it's beautiful. I love it. 
One little bump in the road for this, though, was in the blocking pro process, the colors ran. This teal color ran. And it's not on the back, um, but on the right side, which was faced up on the blocking board. Um, so what I, I just totally dunked the shawl in water and then laid it out. Now, the instructions for the yarn say when you wash it to use vinegar, which I had not read the instructions, totally didn't do that. Um, I imagine I would have had a different result if I had followed instructions, but I didn't. And so I laid it, of course, I pinned it out on the blocking board, laid it out. Um, and at that time, the colors did not run. But when I came back, I had done this in the store and I laid it out on the table here. And when I had come back later, the turquoise had run into that linen color. And like I said, it was only on the front side where it was faced up, not on the back. And at first I was really disappointed because I wanted the clear distinction between the two colors because I thought they really worked well together and I wanted to show that off. Um, but uh, some people like that, like maybe, maybe it was intentional, but I had even considered putting it on the mannequin wrong side facing out where it didn't have the color run. And then I thought, no, I shouldn't because real crocheters are going to know that it's the wrong side facing out. So let's not do that. Let's just put it up the way it is. And I've had a number of people compliment or comment that it looks really nice the way it is. Um, now, the shawl overall, I think, is stunning. It came out really well. Um, and so, yeah, there's my finished object. Isn't it exciting to have a finished object? <laughs> And I don't know how I'm going to have it up there before I get to wear it, but that's, that's where it is at the moment. Works in progress. I have two things to talk about today. One is the hat. Um, this is a hat that I had designed a couple of years ago. Yes, this is crocheted. I've had, I had this on the mannequin before, and I've had people ask me, is that knit? No, it's crocheted. Now, I mean, I'm showing you up close, so maybe you can really tell. But, you know, on a mannequin far away, like halfway across the room, people are like, what? Because um, at first glance, you might think it really is knit, but it's not. It is crocheted. And the reason this is a work in progress is because this yarn is no longer available. So when I had published the pattern, um, people can't find this yarn anymore. So I decided to redo it with a yarn that is available currently. And I decided to use, again, the Shepherd's Mill in their frost line. And this is the Ocean Dreams color because there's these waves on here, right? I thought, okay, let me do something water related. Ocean Dreams, this is a beautiful, let's see, lighting is kind of strange. Beautiful blue um, that has a bit of gray in it. There's just a bit of gray. I thought it's gonna work really well for this hat. And I started it. And then I took it out because I realized I'm that I want to make some adjustments, adjustments to this pattern, um, most specifically this part. So I started, like I said, ripped it out. I need to do it again. Um, so I will get to that and when it is the pattern is finished, decided upon, uh, tested by some other people, I will release it again. So it will be uh, an update on this in blue. <laughs> but I will get back to that after this current work in progress. Which is Oh, I don't want that one. Um, a window display. So currently, my windows are empty because yesterday I took all the Christmas stuff out. So the tree came down, everything Christmas related came down. And what I'm going to do is just a very simple window display and hang snowflakes in the window. So I have a bunch 
of crocheted snowflakes, different kinds. I think I'm using five different patterns. Look at that, isn't that cute? Um, let's see, those are all the same. Now this one, it does have points. <laughs> when I block it, it will have points. It kind of looks more like a flower at the moment, but it is a snowflake. Uh, okay, and this is like the first one I showed you. And then this is different yarn of this pattern. Um, so yeah, making a bunch of these to just hang in the window. But what I'm wanting to do is stiffen them. And I think I'm going to use diluted glue. If you have a suggestion on how I should stiffen these, let me know. But um, my plan is to use diluted glue, dunk them in the glue, and then block them um, into nice shape. So it's not like foldy like this and, you know, look like if it was spinning, like that's not very nice. If it was spinning in, in the window, in the wind, in the window. Um, and then I'm going to hang them with uh, using like Fisher fishing twine, so the clear. Um, and I already have something to hang it off of on top of the window. Um, so they'll just be floating in the window. And they might turn or whatever, but I want them nice and flat and looking good. And I will show you that process in the next podcast because I think that's pretty fun. Um, like I said, when this is done, then I'll get back to that hat. But those are my current works in progress for crochet. And I think that's it for this month for the podcast and all my projects. Um, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Share the channel with those who love alpacas and all things fiber arts, of course. Um, I would appreciate you leaving a comment if you have any suggestions on topics you want me to cover, um, things you want to see at the ranch or the store, um, topics to cover in alpaca life videos, things like that. And finally, if you appreciate what I do on my channel, would you consider buying me a coffee over on my Kofi page? The link is down in the description box as well. And I will see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.